and welcome to the Awakening Series. My name is Kimberly Archuleta. This is a show where we bring brilliant minds together. And today we have an honored guest. His name is Ryan Frazier. Ryan is an entrepreneur sought out for his work at the intersection of capital business, sustainability, and government. He leads Frazier Global, a management consulting firm and Environmental Social Governance Advisory Board. And he is the founder of the Purple Report, which is an ESG market research and stakeholder opinion data firm. We are so excited to have you on the show. Ryan, thank you so much. We are so excited also to hear about your journey. Kimberly, first off, it's just a real treat to be here with you. And uh, congratulations on having this forum to help share your thoughts and perspective and bring people like me on to kind of help, you know, be a part of that process. I hope the viewers uh, appreciate this forum to learn and to share their thoughts as well. Uh, really, really thankful for the opportunity to be here. You know, my, my journey uh, is one of, I, I, I'm fond of always saying that every day is a new adventure. And uh, that's kind of like been the story of my life. Uh, I grew up in a uh, uh, single mom household. Uh, my mom is my hero. Uh, she um, raised three boys, working two, sometimes three jobs uh, to provide for us. Uh, we didn't have a lot. Um, you know, mom taught us to have faith, uh, to work hard and to get out there and make a life for ourselves. And I've always carried those values with me. Uh, I grew up in uh, a working poor neighborhood in the South, Wilmington, North Carolina, which by the way, is also the hometown of someone by the name of Michael. Jordan. Oh and my so, goodness. <laughs> um, I, I wish I could play basketball even an iota as well as he could. Uh, but I'm thankful for my own journey. Uh, from North Carolina, you know, I went off to school and, and ultimately um, entered into the United States Navy, where um, it was the Navy uh, of all branches that brought me to, of all places, Colorado. I joke, but like there's a little dinghy at Cherry Creek Reservoir, and that was my detachment. You would go out there <laughs> late at night, you might see me. No, but uh, I worked. I, I worked in the intelligence um, um, uh, division uh, for the National Security Agency, uh, and uh, after doing five years uh, at NSA and with the Navy um, here in Colorado, I decided that I loved Colorado so much. The quality of life here was so amazing. The opportunities were just so great that I would continue to make it home, raise the family, and uh, you know, went into corporate America. Uh, uh, somehow, some way, not, still not quite sure, I was elected to public office as an at-large city councilman in third largest city in Colorado, right after I turned 26, uh, and served two terms, eight years. Um, so you know, I have a wealth of experience, both in the military and in corporate America, in government. And as you mentioned, I run my own uh, consulting firm, uh, management consulting that we do work with ESG and government relations and, and some other spaces um, with corporates and governments and, and other stakeholders. And recently we launched a new company, which I'm really excited about called Purple Report, which is focused on uh, market research and public and stakeholder opinion research data as it relates to ESG and to industries and governments and communities. Absolutely amazing background. Wow, that you're phenomenal. So glad you're in Colorado. Thank you for that. And to have that um, seat um, as a councilman at, at 26 is, is pretty impressive. Um, a little bit more about the ESG. What is what is that exactly, and what does that stand for? Well, uh, it stands for environmental, social, governance. And the way I like to help both myself and others understand is. Most people have probably heard of sustainability. And so I like to say, if sustainability is the journey, right? We're all on that journey to be more sustainable, right? Um, then ESG, environmental social governance, is how you measure progress. And so understanding that, I think it's very important because oftentimes people kind of think ESG and, and they, they tend to think perhaps just climate climate change. And it's much broader than that. Certainly climate change is a big part of the environmental side of ESG, but there are a range of issues with under the E, you know, including energy management, waste management, water management practices. The S has everything from diversity and inclusion to data privacy, labor practices, 
health and safety practices to the G that includes everything from business ethics to supply chain management and systemic risk and on down the list. But ultimately, it comes down to standards and metrics in the E and the S and the G that help to measure the progress of companies, of governments, of other organizations as it relates to their both financial performance, their value creation, as well as their impacts on society and local communities. I absolutely love this. And um, obviously I feel this should have been in place long ago. And the fact that you have a, a part in putting this together, I mean, wow, what, um, when did this actually start? When did, when did the uh, Environmental Social Governance ESG advisory group start? Gosh, well, you know, I, well, so I've had my company for 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll take a little bit back further. So sustainability um, in, in general, has been around for a while. Um, I mean, probably uh, before both of us were born, you know, I was a late seventies kid, child, um, but sustainability in general was, you know, really seventies is where it started. Uh, and, but it's grown in importance and relevance over the decades and even more so now. ESG is something that has really uh, evolved over the last five to 10 year space in terms of the sophistication and awareness. And it still has a ways to go. To be clear, a lot of people when they hear ESG are like WTF, right? <laughs> so, so, so there's still a lot of public awareness that needs to happen. But amongst a lot of, um, of, of asset owners, uh, think of your pension funds and their, their uh, leadership, uh, your asset managers, people who manage other people's money in terms of investments, in terms of debt, um, you know, and regulators, think the SEC and other folks internationally uh, and other business leaders, ESG has continued to evolve. And what we've seen happen over the past, I would say two, three, maybe even four years is we've seen rapid adoption of ESG because it's become material is the word to the to the performance of companies and governments and other organizations with respect to again their financial performance long term value creation and their impacts on communities and society and one of the things that's really relevant for folks to understand is and again not to get too dorky or technical jargon here but this is important because what what we've seen happen over time, and one of the reasons ESG and sustainability has become increasingly important when it comes to organizations, investments, and things of those natures, is that whereas in 1975, when you looked at, for instance, the valuation of a company in 1975, around 83 or so percent, approximately, of the company's value was tied to tangible assets. All right. So fast forward to 2020, 2021, most recent data I've seen, we've seen a complete flip. Now, roughly 90 percent, uh, to be more exact, closer to 87 percent of a company's valuation is actually tied to intangible assets. Wow. So think of your, your reputation and brand, your customer loyalty, your IP, uh, things that, again, 40 some odd years ago, just weren't weighted like they are today. And because of that, the importance of how you perform around the planet and the environment, how you perform as it relates to your people and your customers and other stakeholders in the communities you operate, how, you, how you're governed, whether governed, governed by the organization, whether it be the board of directors or your executive leadership team or your management you know, uh, approach in general are all that much more important uh, to the long-term performance and value of companies and organizations and even governments. And so that's one of the reasons that ESG has become such a big deal. Um, and in my view, it's only going to get more so. Absolutely. So are there a ton of companies out there that aren't familiar with ESG? I mean, especially new, fast growing companies, maybe even tech startups, you know, they're so wrapped up in what they're doing and producing and, you know, services, software, whatever it may be. Um, how do you introduce something like this to them? Well, there are a ton of companies who are adopting ESG standards and metrics right now and, and implementing sustainable business strategies. A lot of them are big companies, right? They're, they're your they're your Nikes and your Targets and, you know, some of the larger oil and gas companies even, uh, but also tech companies, uh, banks. There are a number and they're not just in the U.S. In fact, a great many companies that have adopted ESG are international, places like Europe, and Asia, uh, and it's growing uh, every 
day. What we're seeing, though, is now that the bigger companies have been adopted and the value of ESG is continuing to be demonstrated, is we're seeing now a lot of middle market companies, the smaller companies, if you will, starting to say, hey, this is something we need to pay attention to. Because here's the thing, Kimberly, not everybody wants to be first, right, when it comes to like new stuff, all right, but nobody wants to be last. And so, you know, I think what you're seeing is a lot of folks starting to become more aware and say, how does this relate to me, to my customers, to my business, to my stakeholders? You know, because at the end of the day, right, we're all we all want to have um, a positive impact on our communities while also running, you know, good businesses or good governments or other good organizations. And so, yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot uh, of adoption at the, you know, big, big companies, but that but that level of awareness and thus adoption amongst uh, the smaller companies is, is increasing. And this is even something that's relevant to smaller businesses. And I know, look, I'm a small business owner, right? I get it. You know, for, we, we automatically think, oh, more paperwork and more stuff. I'm just trying to run my business. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of stuff you're already doing that could be uh, easily adopted or are already kind of considered ESG practices. And there are other best practices that if you started doing could help your business be that much more profitable and positively, positively impactful on your local community. You know, just simple things like, for instance, uh, your energy usage. Uh, there's one company that, uh, you know, they adopted electricity monitoring for their buildings, right? You would think, oh, well, that's, that's, a, that's actually a, a sustainable business strategy. It falls under ESG. They were able to reduce their energy usage by implementing electricity monitoring usage in their buildings by 20%. That means they increase their net operating income, right? So they're more profitable because of a simple sustainable business strategy that most people would probably say, oh, I didn't know that was ESG. Well, yeah. And there's stuff like that with it, coffee shops and the, the packaging materials and, and things that you use that can make you more efficient. Uh, while also being good for the planet, for instance. And there are other practices that are just good for people, for your employees, as well as your customers. This is so huge. I love that. I kind of can go back to being a board of advisor for Save on Solar and them having these reports done with the cannabis industry because they use mm -hmm. so much energy. They're one of the biggest consumers of energy in Colorado, and I'm sure yeah. eventually um, elsewhere in other states. But the, all of that energy, so putting on the solar panels is really helping, you know, cut that that energy usage. So, right. I mean, that's just Listen, one small part, but what you're talking so about is amazing. I got I to gotta tag on there, Kimberly, because you just touched on something. That's one industry, right, uh, that is, as you mentioned, are, are tremendously big users of energy, um, most of which is not uh, renewable uh, right. necessarily. Uh, and, for instance, solar. Uh, when, but there was a recent... Um, Report. So you you probably know this. I uh, I host. I know you know this. I host the business brief um, for NBC Nine News each week. I bring on different business guests and economics uh, folks and finance folks. And I'm going to have some more cannabis businesses on. We're going to talk about sustainability in the cannabis industry. But there was a report um, that actually came out by PBS. Just came out within the last few days, I think. Um, that actually talks to your point about how cannabis actually um, the level of greenhouse gas emissions due to cannabis because of its high energy usage is on par with coal, mm -hmm. <laughs> which you're like, wow. You know, that's, that's, yeah, you just, so you're just like, wow. And again, I'm not knocking any industry. I'm simply saying, you know, if the effort is to, you know, reduce carbon emissions and, um, and, and, and be more, you know, more friendly to the environment, cannabis has to take this seriously because they are a large contributor from what the data suggests to that, um, that problem, if you will, for society. Again, sustainability, understanding how you measure progress on your, your energy usage, uh, your, your social um, uh, practices, uh, and your governance overall are all part of helping you be very strategic, but also um, you know, very intentional and disciplined along that journey. Absolutely. And so how would, say, for example, a smaller business get in or a small to mid-level business get into um, the best practices? Is there a website that they would go to and kind of, um, you know, take a look at a checklist or, yeah. or sign up yeah, as, as like they're going to do it and, they, you know, they're full right. fledged um, going to, you know, it's almost like, uh, yes, I'm not going to text and drive and I'm going to sign this petition because, you know, when you write something down, it means something. So right. I don't know, is it something like that? Yeah, there, there's, there are some, there are several different forums and vehicles uh, to do that. So I, for one, am involved with a couple of different groups. I won't name them all, but I'll name a couple that I think are relevant. Um, you know, from the, from a company perspective and the business perspective, SASB, uh, that's an acronym, 
uh, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board has a lot of good information out there. You can go to SASB, that's S-A-S-B.org, and kind of look at some of their materials and information and, de and determine what you think is relevant to your business as it relates to your industry. Um, those are some helpful pointers and information that can assist you. I also subscribe to PRI, the Principles for Responsible Investment. Now, this is more tied to those who do investment, uh, whether it be public equities or whether it be um, um, you know, debt markets or even private equity, but still, um, you know, they have uh, best practices and, uh, you know, kind of best in class approaches to integrating ESG uh, sustainable business strategies into your investments as well as your, your, your business overall. So those are a couple, but there's a lot of other resources out there. Simply being aware of ESG and that it potentially could be relevant to your business. Again, doesn't mean everything is relevant. You have to look and determine for yourself what are those things that are relevant to your business that you can adopt that can help you be a better business and a better citizen in society. So great, uh, Ryan, that's amazing. I'd love to talk a little bit more about the Purple Report. Can you give us some yeah. insight about that? Um, you know, I've, I've done a bit of research, but I'd love the audience to know. Yeah, so Purple Report is a new business endeavor that we recently launched. I'm actually really excited about Purple Report because uh, it's kind of addressing what I believe to be a need in the market that is not being addressed consistently or to the extent it needs to be today around public and stakeholder opinion research tied to ESG, environmental social governance, and industries and or governments. Um, I always like to think, right, like when we talk about ESG, we talk about sustainability, we talk about climate change, we talk about reducing our energy usage or using renewables, or we talk about diversity and inclusion, or we talk about um, a living wage or, you know, a number of issues. I've always felt, what does my mom think? Right. You know, like what is the people who live in these communities or who work for these companies or other stakeholders? How do they see some of these issues? And so the Purple Report is really targeted towards understanding that level of sentiment and also being able to look at that sentiment, that opinion research over time. And, and, and it helps, I think, companies and governments and others uh, who are making decisions around sustainable business strategies or ESG practices to hopefully to be uh, more informed and to uh, understand their constituents, to understand their, their public and other stakeholders. And so uh, we launched it. We, 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 we had, had our first report um, in, uh, in August. Wow. Uh, we released it in September. We did a national survey with uh, this first one where we talked to uh, people all across uh, the United States about their views around uh, environmental social governance practices. Uh, that can be useful to companies, to industry associations, to governments, uh, understanding their views. And we're going to continue to go kind of industry by industry. Uh, we may do one in cannabis. Uh, mm -hmm. We are doing one right now uh, in alcoholic beverages. Uh, so, you know, for Colorado. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, everything from craft breweries to wineries, and distilleries. And we're going to talk about environmental social governance practices. And we'll actually have that survey conducted and completed soon. Uh, that data will be coming out. And then we're going to keep going industry by industry. But then we're, we're looking at also entering kind of the, the, the municipal bond market um, because a lot of these uh, state and local governments who are going out to their people for different types of bonds, whether it be green bonds or social impact bonds or other financing mechanisms, you know, they need to have insights when it comes to the increasing importance of ESG factors of what their citizens, what their taxpayers and voters what do they see? What do they think when it comes to ESG? So the Purple Report is really tailored to help kind of address what I believe to be a, a big need in the market around reliable data uh, and, uh, and public opinion and stakeholder opinion research. Absolutely. I love that. If you wouldn't mind, how many questions are, um, are in the survey? It depends. You know, um, obviously, like any of us, if you get a huge survey, you're going to lose most people. I don't right. care how right. intellectual or you know, much you love reading, like if it's a 50 question survey, I mean, I can tell you, but one, you lost me. Right. <laughs> and so I'm like, nope. But, you know, we try to keep them really relatively short and interesting. Um, you know, so, you know, a typical survey might be 20 or so questions. Um, you know, with, yeah. With some demographic questions around it. So obviously we want to know, kind of, you know, different you know, questions about you. And, you know, so that helps us to kind of segment the data when, when we get it back. Uh, so we can say, hey, you live in this part of the country or this part of Colorado or, 
Um, you're a Republican or an independent or a Democrat, or you're a high wage earner or you're a low wage earner. You know, you know we want to be able to look at different slices of the data uh, to help understand different viewpoints. But yeah, 20 or so is kind of the, the, the norm uh, with some demographic questions around it. So, uh, but they can be longer and they can be more complex. Uh, it all depends on who you're talking to, um, you know. And so if I'm talking to a specific targeted population um, that are more inclined to do the survey, we can probably get away with um, more questions. But it, but again, not too many, because I don't care who you are. 50 questions in, you're like, ah. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I got other stuff to do. I got I to gotta gotta feed the kids. Um, so I, we get that. But we hope that increasingly more and more people that we talk to will participate to help inform um, you know, different uh, companies and, and investment groups and, and government and other NGOs uh, about, you know, their views, because I think whether you like what they have to say or not, it's important to hear what they have to say, uh, because I think that's an important part of trust uh, and hopefully being better stewards of, of, uh, of the economy and the planet and, uh, and people. Where can we find, is this like public information? Will this be public information, I guess? Some of it will. I mean, some of it will be um, private, depending on the stakeholder that we may um, provide that data to, but most of it should be available public. Um, we have a, a website. Uh, it's, believe it or not, purplereport.org. <laughs> uh, so that's the key distinction. So purplereport, one word, dot org. Uh, you can go there and check out the first survey. And like I said before, within the matter of a week or two, we'll have the next one up and we're going to keep rolling them out. So a lot of the data will be publicly available, uh, but there may be some aspects, some reports that are um, confidential or kept to a specific stakeholder um, that we are providing that, 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 that assessment for, if you will. Wonderful. That sounds amazing. Everything you're doing sounds so wonderful. And I I hope I hope that I'm a, a steward of of sustainability in, in every single way. Um, what I think we need, I know it's just, I mean it's kind of off topic, but I think we all need to um, compost. <laughs> Canada's been doing it forever, and I think every single uh, we should be given a compost station for every single household from the government, so we can help with you know carbon uh, carbon emissions as well. That's just my two cents well, about you it. You know, and, and for whatever it's worth, that's exactly the type. Type of question you know we might include in a purple report survey of you know whether it be toronto or whether it be aurora colorado or lakewood or miami you know if if there's an interest by a company or an industry or a government or an ngo um you know a regulator you know those are types of questions that we may want to ask and, and understand what are the views of the people who live in the community around that type of sustainable business strategy or sustainable st uh, practice you know, and, and again, I always say this, Kimberly, you know, you're not always going to hear what you want to hear, but that's exactly why it's important um, to get that feedback. Uh, but you, you may find a lot of surprises in there. You're like, yeah, you know, that's really, really cool. Um, I will say this, and we're, we're, as we wrap up, you know, Abraham Lincoln, uh, President Abraham Lincoln, in 1858, he was debating um, Stephen Douglas as he was running for the U.S. Senate out of Illinois. Um, as you may know, or may, may not know, I don't know, but Stephen Douglas was actually, um, he took a position of indifference when it came to slavery, although he was known to be publicly for it. And uh, Abraham Lincoln kind of had a bit of a, in my words, not his, a WTF moment himself with uh, him in these debates. But he wrote, uh, or spoke actually, something that I think is relevant to what we do with the Purple Report, is he said that public sentiment is everything. He said, with it, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. And he goes on to say a few more things around public sentiment. But that is the basis, if you will, for why I believe it's so important and why it's needed as ESG becomes more and more relevant in our society. Wow, that was beautiful, Ryan. Thank you so much. And I couldn't agree more. That was lovely. I am just so proud of you. And please continue to do your amazing work. I'm sure that um, you'll continue to, you know, raise the bar with all of the companies that are involved and companies that will eventually, you know, be a part of this. So what you're doing is just phenomenal. And I'm just so honored to have you on this show. I um, last question would be, you know, um, is there anything we didn't mention that you'd like to discuss? I mean, you have so much knowledge. Anything else? No, not really. Other than that, I didn't miss out. I do have four kids and family who that, uh, you know, are a big part of my motivation as well. 
Um, you know, you think about like why you do what you do, right? And a part of that purpose for me uh, is is family. And you know, not having had a dad growing up, um, it's important to me to to be a good dad. Um, not a perfect dad. I certainly know I have some shortcomings, um, but I try to be a good dad. And and so a part of that as an entrepreneur, a business owner, um, as a part of society, is you know, I want to make sure I give them an example as it relates to getting out there working hard and. Um, and doing something positive with your life to hopefully make a uh, positive impact on the community. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the family. Love it. And I'm so glad you did. As yeah. far as where we can find you, where can we find you? Well, um, I mentioned before, purplereport.org uh, for that information. FraserGlobal.com uh, is my, uh, my business, my consulting business website. I'm also on LinkedIn. So if you're watching here, uh, I love LinkedIn. It's actually like my social media tool primarily that I love to read and learn from uh, and engage with. So, you know, if you're if you're a user of LinkedIn, uh, please find me, um, send me a, a note and say, hey, I saw your interview with Kimberly and want to be connected. I'd love to connect with you. Awesome. Ryan, you are wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. Super excited about what you're doing and just honored to have you on the show. Thank you again. Thanks. Thanks, Ray.